Public hospitals should be for the poor. Everyone else should have private health insurance. Although this might sound like a quote from the Prime Minister of Australia Scott Morrison back when he was Treasurer in 2017, after a bit of investigation, I think this quote might actually be fake news. The only reference I can find to it is on quotes.net, with the source given as Radio 2017. I've searched Google far and wide and can't find any other sources, so I think one of the editors at Quotes.net has been a naughty little boy and started making up quotes. But feel free to correct me, because trust me, I love a good ScoMo quote. Here's a quote that Scott Morrison actually said back when he was Treasurer in 2017. During Parliament question time when asked about the economy and jobs in regional Australia, he pulled out a lump of coal from behind a piece of paper and replied, this is coal. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. It won't hurt you. It's coal. To be fair, the coal was lacquered to prevent his hands from turning black, but that's beside the point. Yes, the then Treasurer brought in a lump of coal into Parliament to try to make some smart-ass point about job security and sustainable energy in Australia. I get it. Coal has played an important part in Australia's economy and electrical grid, but clearly this was a stunt. It was a way to mock those who wanted to push Australia's transition away from fossil fuels towards more renewable energy sources. Anyway, that was more than two years ago, so let's get on to 2019. As a wrap-up to 2019, I decided to search Google News for the top Scott Morrison articles, one from each month of the year. So let's begin. January. Photoshop fail. It was supposed to be the perfect family photo, the smiling family man with his loving wife and kids. But the photo quickly went viral when social media users were quick to point out one rather glaring flaw. The Prime Minister had two left feet and a pair of photoshopped shoes. ScoMo quickly went into damage control, claiming that the photo was doctored by someone in his department without his authorization or consent, and consequently tried to rectify the situation by sending out a tweet showing his real, everyday shoes. Smooth. February. The Christmas Island Detention Centre Grand Reopening. After the so-called Medivac Bill was passed in Parliament, a bill which would allow sick refugees to be transported to Australia for treatment on the advice of doctors, one which Scott Morrison fiercely opposed, he decided to spread some fear by claiming that the bill would bring an influx of fake asylum seekers to the country. In response, he reopened the Christmas Island Detention Centre to cope with the imminent influx. Of course, there was no influx, as the bill only applied to people who were already in offshore detention centres in Nauru or Manus Island. Apparently, the reopening cost almost $27 million, with only four people so far being detained, a Tamil family from Sri Lanka. Despite the United Nations Human Rights Committee requesting their release, the Australian government decided to simply ignore the UN. Smooth. March. Quiet Australians. Although the term quiet Australians is most synonymous with Mr Morrison's election win in May, he had been using the term for a number of months prior to that, in the wake of the Christchurch shootings in March, he responded by giving a speech on tribalism. He said, As debate becomes more fierce, the retreat to tribalism is increasingly taking over, and for some, extremism takes hold. Reading only news that we agree with, interacting with people only we agree with, and having less understanding standing and grace towards others that we do not even know, making the worst possible assumptions about them and their motives simply because we disagree with them. This is true of the left and the right, and even more so from those shouting from the fringes to a mainstream of quiet Australians that just want to get on with their lives. Hate, blame and contempt are the staples of tribalism. It is consuming modern debate, egged on by an appetite for conflict as entertainment, not so different from the primitive appetites of the Colosseum days, with a similar corrosive impact on the fabric of our society. To be fair to Scott Morrison, I think he put that pretty well. April. The first election debate. The then leader of the opposition, Bill Shorten, wins the first election debate to Scott Morrison. As we'll soon see in May, it didn't help. May. Scott Morrison wins the Australian federal election, or more accurately, Labor loses the election. The polls had it wrong. Bill Shorten had it wrong. The entire Australian Labor Party had it wrong. Instead of focusing on defeating the coalition, the Labor Party had already banked the win, and were thinking about government instead. 
June, Federal Police Raids. The Australian Federal Police raid the home of journalist Annika Smethurst over an alleged national security leak. One day later, they raid the Sydney offices of the ABC. Of course, Scott Morrison dismissed any concerns that we're living in some kind of police state and defended the raids. He said, "...it never troubles me that our laws are being upheld." Of course, he fails to mention that every totalitarian state in history uses the same ridiculous logic. It's no secret that immoral regimes create laws to further their own nefarious ends. As I've mentioned in other videos, press freedom is paramount to democracy and is under attack in Australia. Without it, we may as well be living in communist China. July, tax cuts for the wealthy. $158 billion in tax cuts passed the Senate. At first glance, it looked like everyone would benefit, but the tax cuts come in three stages. The third stage, set to be introduced in 2025, unfairly favours the rich, while the poor get very little relief. I've explained it all in another video, Bye Bye Progressive Tax in Australia. The video wasn't very popular because apparently many Australians like regressive taxes and don't see it as a problem. August. The Pacific Islands Forum was held in the tiny island nation of Tuvalu. The forum focused on the negative effects of climate change on the Pacific Island nations. Even Scott Morrison acknowledged that climate is the single biggest threat to their security. However, Australia was a lone dissenting voice in the forum's final declaration, calling for an immediate global ban on new coal mines and coal-fired power plants. Scott Morrison was having none of it. His love of coal was starting to rear its ugly head again. In response, he said, I'm accountable to the Australian people. That's who I'm accountable for. Actually, the majority of Australians, 58.56%, didn't vote for Scott Morrison, but that's not really his concern. That's the concern of democracy and our voting system as a whole. September, the United Nations Climate Summit. Australia wasn't invited to speak at the summit due to its lack of ambitious emissions reduction targets. Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg gave a powerful speech about the world's inaction on climate change. However, Scott Morrison wasn't too impressed. It didn't fit his pro-coal agenda. Millions marched across the world in climate protests, with thousands of school students skipping school to attend the rallies. In response, Mr Morrison had this to say, I do understand that people feel strongly about this, but I think we also have to take stock. We have to ensure we get a proper context and perspective. I want children growing up in Australia to feel positive about their future, and I think it is important we give them that confidence that they will not only have a wonderful country and pristine environment to live in, that they will also have an economy to live in as well. I don't want our children to have anxieties about these issues. Ah, economy before environment. The classic Morrison mantra. October. War on climate activism. OK, this is just getting repetitive now. Morrison needed to let everyone know that he stands up for the most vulnerable segment of our society, the coal industry. In a speech to the Queensland Resources Council, he made it abundantly clear that he plans to outlaw indulgent and selfish practices that threaten the mining sector. He urged businesses to ignore rowdy protesters waging economic sabotage. He also warned activists that they were testing the limits of their right to protest. He said, "...a new breed of radical activism is on the march. Apocalyptic in tone, brooks no compromise, all or nothing. Alternative views not permitted." But most importantly, he named businesses moving away from the mining sector as the most worrying development, with Australian exports still highly dependent on coal and other environmentally damaging industries. November. Australia burns. Former fire chiefs tried to warn Scott Morrison that he needed to do more to help against the horror bushfire season, but he refused. The chiefs critiqued that the coalition were putting climate politics ahead of what was actually happening in the real world. They said the government fundamentally doesn't like talking about climate change. Any attempt to talk about the climate crisis fell on deaf ears. It simply didn't go along with their pro-coal, anti-climate change rhetoric. In response, what did Mr Morrison do? December. Holiday in Hawaii. Yes, while Australians were burning and coughing up smoke, Mr Morrison felt it necessary to take his family away on holidays to Hawaii. He decided to return to Australia only after two volunteer firefighters were killed when their truck rolled over after being hit by a falling tree while they were travelling to battle blazes in Sydney southwest. Mr Morrison apologised for causing any offence, but reiterated his hardline stance that volunteer firefighters should not be compensated. Although he has since caved a little bit by offering four weeks paid leave to volunteer firefighters with public sector jobs. 
Anyway, that's 12 months of ScoMo in 2019. In summary, the climate crisis doesn't exist. Holidays are more important than bushfires. There's no place in Australia for nosy journalists and noisy protesters. And most importantly, coal is king and has been since that day in Parliament back in 2017. At least he's consistent.